Okay, when we left off last time, um, we had completed um, uh, finding the internal forces in a simply supported beam with a point load on it. We had a point load that we had been given applied to the beam and we knew how long it was. But you could imagine that that is a beam system that would come up again and again and again. So what if we tried to do it with placeholders? as a placeholder for what that point load could be and what that length could be. And maybe we could see if we can solve what the answers would be. So maybe next time we have a point load and a length, we could more easily determine what those are rather than going through the process of method of sections every single time. So let's try beam one, no values. doing method of sections, which is the system we use to uh, find the internal forces of all of our elements. And we have a simply supported member. Um, we've been told that the length is L. So we don't know how long it is, but we're gonna use the placeholder L. We've been told that there's a load on it and the load is P, but we don't know what it is. We've also been told that that point load is halfway along the length of the beam. So it's at the halfway point, exactly the same way our last example was. We know from the image we saw that this is a simply supported beam, which has a pin roller condition. We've seen enough now that we know that this Rx, because there's no applied load in the x direction, that this Rx usually shakes out to be zero for these. But we're gonna keep maintaining the process because we might come across situations where we don't have zero in that direction. And we'll call this R1 and we'll call this R2. So the very first thing we have to do is determine what our reactions are. So let's find our I always write in all capitals, but I'm teaching my son to write uppercase and lowercase, so I've been doing a lot of writing in lowercase, and it's really throwing me off on how I write things out. Uh, so I apologize for that. It's amazing how quickly you can change your, ha your habits. Okay, so for the reactions, we know that we have three equations we can use to help us solve this. Summing the forces in the x direction, summing the forces in the y direction, and spinning it about or summing the moments about a point, and we can pick whatever point. And we wanna know what it takes for all of those summations to equal zero, because that means it is not moving. And so if we can find out what reactions are required to make it not move, we'll know that we'll be able to figure out what it takes to be in equilibrium. The sum of the forces in the x direction, we wanna know what it takes to be zero. We have Rx, and Rx is the only thing, which means Rx is zero. Let's sum our moments about a point, saying everything spinning in this direction is positive, and we're gonna spin it about the z axis, so going in and out of the page, and we wanna know what it takes to be zero, and let's pick what point we're gonna spin it about. Like I've said, I'm lazy and when I'm solving for the reactions, I almost always pick the left-hand side, just because then I have a consistent process and I almost don't even need to think about it. R1 and Rx pass directly through that point. To be a moment, you need a force and a distance or an eccentricity. Those both have an eccentricity of zero relative to the node we're trying to spin it about, so they don't cause a moment. Our point P does cause this to spin. If I put a thumbtack here and pushed my paper in the direction it tried to spin it, you'd see my paper would spin in this direction. Or if I curled my right hand with my fingers in the direction it tried to curl it, my thumb is trying to point into the page, which means my moment is negative. So minus P times its eccentricity, which is one half of the length. We also have Rx trying to spin our beam in the positive direction. So plus 
sorry, R2, not Rx, plus our R2 times its eccentricity, which is the full length of the beam. And we want to know what it takes for this to be zero. The reaction is what we're looking for, so let's rearrange this, and we can solve this. We get R2 equals P times 1 half L divided by L, which is the same thing as 1 half P. So R2 equals 1 half P. Let's think about that for a second. When you looked at this and you knew that there was 20 kilonewtons on here, you instinctively and intuitively knew that 10 went over here and 10 went over here. This just mathematically proved that what you intuitively know, that half of the load goes over to R2. So let's take a look. I think you're gonna see where this goes when we sum the forces in the Y direction, where upwards is positive, we have R1 going upwards, P going downwards, plus R2 going upwards, but we've solved for R2, which is 1 half P. That gives us R1 minus 1 half P. We rearrange the equation. R1 also equals 1 half P. Again, half of P goes over here and half of P goes over there. Something you probably intuitively and instinctively knew. Now, let's try doing our method of sections. Before, we cut three times between here and here, and we cut three times between here and here. Well, let's do it saying we don't know where between here and here we're gonna cut, and we're gonna use a placeholder X. So now we're gonna cut some unknown length between R1 and P. We don't know where, but somewhere between there, and we're gonna do it as some unknown length x. So let's draw that section that we've developed here. We have our beam, which is some length x. We've already determined our reaction here, and we know that this reaction is dependent on what that value p is. So it's not like p is thrown out. It's not like we're not using p. Our R1 is directly dependent on P. It was less obvious when we use numbers, but look, this really drives it home. It is actually one half P. It becomes really clear how dependent this value is on that force P, even though we don't see it in this part of the method of sections. We know we're cutting it somewhere and it has this reaction here, but we know it's not spinning off into space or sliding around. So there must be something internally happening, connecting it to the other half of this section that stops it from doing that. We wanna know what those internal forces are. So we're gonna give them placeholder names of V and M or shear and moment. I like to always draw my unknown shear downwards which is negative, and my moment's spinning in the opposite direction. You don't have to do it that way, but be consistent. Always do it consistently, whatever you do, so that you have a very clear frame of reference when you try to see it all as a big picture at the end. So let's take a look what we have here. We're gonna use our same three equations. We're gonna sum our forces in X, sum our forces in Y, and sum our moments about a point. But look at this, we have nothing going in the X direction. We know zero is going to be zero. So let's just not even bother there. Let's sum our forces in the Y direction, where everything going upwards would be positive, and we wanna know what it takes for this to be zero. Well, we have one half P going upwards minus V, and we wanna know what it takes for this to be zero. V is what we're interested in here. If we rearrange this, V equals one half P. So anywhere between our reaction and our force, P is, or V is going to equal one half P. When we did that, I'm just going back and pulling up the stuff from the example we did yesterday, or no, you guys don't see it as yesterday, you guys are watching this in a linear way. When we did that in the last example, you could see that anywhere between our reaction and our applied load, we had a shear of 10, 
which was half of our applied load of 20. So this seems to be making sense with what we had already calculated. Let's sum our moments with that direction being positive about the z-axis. And this is where I said, I always like to pick the point where I cut here. So before that was some dimension relative to zero, but we have this unknown dimension x. So I'm doing it at x over from the reaction. And I wanna know what it takes for this to be zero. Well, one half p, my reaction is pointing, is causing it to spin about that point. V is passing directly through it, and my moment is causing it to spin. One half P, if I took my finger and held it as a thumbtack right here and pushed in this direction, it's gonna try to make the paper spin in this direction, or if I curled my fingers in the direction it tries to spin it, my thumb is pointing into the page, which means it is a negative number, so minus one half P, times its eccentricity, and it is x away from the point we're trying to spin it about. V passes directly through it, so it doesn't cause a moment, and then we have our unknown moment, which is causing it to spin, and I drew it in the positive direction. I can rearrange this, and I get M equals 1 half PX. So, if I was right at the beginning, if x was zero, well, m equals zero. If m was some explicit different distance at the halfway part, or l equals one half, well, we'll get to that. We'll come to that in a little bit. Let's include our units here because we were given units in the question. So we now know that anywhere between zero and x, v is one half of p, which is our applied load, and m is one half of p times x, which is wherever we decided to cut it. So we're in control, we're picking whatever x we want, and p is the applied load. So we can find shear or moment anywhere between the reaction and the point load. Now let's cut it between p and l, or our total distance all the way at the end. And again, we're gonna use X as a placeholder for our uh, where our cut is. Let's draw this one. We know that this is what we're calling X. We have an applied load of P, we know that it's one half of L along the length of the beam. And we've already solved for our reaction, which is one half P. And we wanna know what internal force it, huh, look at that. I drew that in the wrong spot. Let's draw this right here instead. And we have some shear and some moment keeping this from flying off into space because we know our overall member is in equilibrium or has some reactions that are keeping it in equilibrium. So now we can do the same thing we did last time. We can sum our forces in the y direction where upwards is positive and we've got one half P going upwards from our reaction. We've got P going downwards in the negative direction and our V going downwards. We can rearrange this and we get V equals minus one half P kilonewtons. Well, when we did this, we saw that anywhere between the point load and our uh, right-hand reaction, our shear was in fact half of the point load. We can now sum the moments in the positive direction about a z-axis and let's pick our point x again. Let's pick point x. 
So if we put a thumbtack right here, we need to see what all the other things do. V passes right through it, so no eccentricity. We don't need to worry about it. We've got minus one half P times X, or our minus one half P that's trying to spin it in this direction, and it is X distance away. We've also got our P, so we've got a thumbtack here, it's trying to spin it in this direction, which is our positive direction. So we've got P times some unknown eccentricity here. This distance right here is our total overall X minus one half L, or X minus one half L. And then we also have our moment. I've drawn it in the positive direction. So we can rearrange this and we get that our moment equals minus one half P X plus one half P L. So this one's starting to look a little bit more complicated. Let's maybe start writing out a little summary and see what this means at different X points. So let's write ourselves a little summary here. All right, so let's look at different X values and we'll look at different shear values in kilonewtons and we'll look at different moment values in, sorry, in kilonewton meters. So at X equals zero, to one half L, we had found that V equaled one half P and our moment equaled one half PX. And when X equaled one half L to L, we found that V equaled minus one half P and M equaled minus one half PX plus one half PL. So let's take a look at some of those. Let's do X equals zero, X equals one quarter L, X equals one half L, X equals one half L just to the other side of our point load. Remember like we did last time? But for us, it doesn't really seem to mean anything, but we'll do it once with the top equations and once with the bottom equations. So we're saying that one of them is this one half L and the other one is this one half L. And let's do three quarter L and let's do L. So here uh, at X equals zero, it looks like X doesn't come into the equation. We've got one half P. If we plug, we've got one half P times zero equals zero. We now have one half, oh, sorry. There is no X in this equation, so it's still one half P. Over here, we know we need to put one quarter L in for X, or we've got one half P times one quarter L equals one eighth PL. At one half L using our top equations, we still have one half P and now we've got one half P times one half L. We have one quarter PL. Let's do one half L now, but using our X equations or our equations for moment and shear between one half L and L. Well now, again, there's still no X in the equation, but it's minus one half P. We're gonna plug one half L into our big equation here where we've got minus one half P times one half L plus one half P L. If we work all of this out, we end up with one quarter P L. 
We can plug in 3 quarter L into everywhere we have X. Shear doesn't have X in the equation, so it's still minus 1 half P. And now we've got minus 1 half P times 3 quarter L plus 1 half PL. We can work this out, and look, we get 1 eighth PL. Again, plugging L in, we still have minus 1 half P, and now we have minus 1 half P times L plus 1 half P times L. Those are going to cancel each other out, and we end up with zero. So now, it's probably really helpful, I find drawing these out gives us a nice little visual of what's going on. So we had, we had a load, reactions, and reactions. This was P, this was L, this was in kilonewtons, and this was in meters. So this is our free body diagram. This is our shear diagram. And it's in kilonewtons. At x equals zero, we got one half p. It was the same at one quarter of the length and half of the length. And at one half p, or one half l, it looked like there was a jump from positive one half p to negative one half p. And it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. And so I've said that positive and negative doesn't really have much meaning in shear. What really matters is that we switch over the line. So the, ne the worst case shear here is still one half p. It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. Look what happens right here. We go from one half p to minus one half p, which is p. But look, it looks like that is literally the load that was applied there. Our reaction was one half p. So it looks like we go up for our reaction, we go across until something happens, we drop down, and then we go across until something else happens. All right, now let's take a look at what we got for our bending moment diagram. And that's in kilonewton meters. I would like to, uh, it'll come up later, Never mind. Um, so now we can take a look at what we had figured out up here. At x equals zero, we had m equals zero. At x equals uh, one quarter of L, we got one eighth PL. At half of L, we got one quarter PL and it didn't matter which side of the point load we were on. And then we dropped down to one eighth again and back down to zero. So it looks like, and so this was one quarter PL and this is one eighth PL. Let's test it. Let's test it if P equals 20 kilonewtons and L equals 15 meters. Remember, this is the example that we had done. It looks like our maximum shear, or V max, equals one half P. And our M max equals one quarter PL. So let's take a look at that. And we found that our reactions one equaled reaction two, and those both equaled one half P. So let's see with these numbers. We know that reaction one should equal reaction two, 
which should equal one half p, which is one half of 20 equals 10 kilonewtons. Well, that's what we found when we did the method of sections with numbers. V max should equal one half p, or one half times 20 or 10 kilonewtons, which is what we found when we did our, uh, our, our example with numbers. And then finally, our maximum moment should be one quarter PL, or one quarter times 20 times 15, and we can plug that in, and we get 0.5 times 20 times 15 Sorry. Oh, sorry, one quarter. <laughs> one quarter. 75 kilonewton meters. When you're writing it again and again and again, you start to just copy what's in the line above. That's why it's really important to have a sense of what you should be getting as your answer. Um, it's also really hard to try to talk through it while you're doing it. Okay, so we saw that we had the exact same thing when we did it using our placeholders as we did when we did it using numbers. So maybe doing it with placeholders, um, if we have a bunch of situations, might start to help us out. So let's... Let's, before we go on to the next... Oh, so that, that's the end of the example. Um, the uh, lecture, that's the end of the, ex is that the end of the examples? No. So go back to the lecture. You will learn about analogous point loads, which is um, uh, a, a way to represent a uniformly distributed line load. So I'm assuming now you've gone back and watched that, and we're going to do our last example, or our example uh, is Beam two, I really wish I could record this all as one thing, but I have to record these using my phone and I have to record everything else using my computer. It's the only way I can kind of get the setup to work. Um, uh, and we are doing um, no numbers. And it is a simply supported beam with a UDL, or a uniformly distributed line load on it, which means that there was some tributary width that was loading up our beam, and now we're looking at this in the side on profile. So let's draw our beam here. We're gonna use placeholders. It has a length L, but we don't know what it is. And it has a UDL on it, or every meter, there is some amount of load being applied. They've told us that the placeholder is W kilonewtons per meter. So every meter length of this beam is seeing W kilonewtons. We have reaction one and reaction two, and we have Rx. There's no applied loads. I'm just gonna go right ahead and note that we've summed our reactions in X and we've got zero. So we've got our free body diagram of our beam loading here. The first thing we wanna do is find reactions. Um, our reactions, we're going to need to use the trick of analogous point loads. Remember, the analogous point load is just used to help us solve that explicit free body diagram. 
when we cut our method of sections, we will have to look at using a different analogous point load. This is only applicable because we're looking at the entire length of the beam. So let's assume we're cutting this beam somewhere along its length x. Oh no, we're not doing that yet. Sorry, we're finding reactions. Huh, I'm getting one step ahead of myself. Okay, so we're, we're still in the process of finding our uh, reactions, but I am going to use an analogous point load. And so instead of this UDL, I'm going to use a point load that represents it, or my analogous load, that represents this uniformly distributed load happening at the middle of it. And this analogous point load, we said that for every kilonewton of length, we had W applied to it. So we have length L, or that L meters, so our total load in kilonewtons is W times L, or WL. We still have our unknown reaction, R1 and R2 and our length L in meters. We can sum our forces in the Y direction where upwards is positive. Um, Actually, you know what? I'm gonna do it slightly out of a different order. It really just depends on what I'm feeling like on the day. Some of it is I know what's gonna give us an answer right away. Let's go right to summing the moments about a point. We are going to sum the moments about reaction one. Remember, when I'm doing, when I'm solving this for the reaction, I always like to do the left hand support. You don't have to do it there. You can pick wherever you want it. But look, if you picked right here, you'd have two unknowns and your only known would have no impact on you. You could do it over here and you'd be left with one unknown. It really is up to you, but I consistently do it from this point right here for finding the reactions. So if we spin it about this point right here, R1 passes right through it, so it does not cause it to spin. Our force, our analogous point load, does cause it to spin. It causes it to spin in this direction, which is our negative direction. If I take my right hand and curl my fingers in that direction, my thumb can only point downwards. People always argue this. They say, but look, what if I did this? Well, if you take your right hand and curl your fingers in the way it's trying to spin, upwards is positive, downwards is negative. So we have this analogous point load causing it to spin in the negative direction, and our analogous point load is WL, and this analogous point load is taking place at one half of the length. So our eccentricity is one half of L. We also have our reaction two, causing it to spin in this direction. I drew it upwards, which causes it to spin in a positive direction here. If I got a negative answer for R2, I've drawn my arrow wrong. So it's causing it to spin in the positive direction, R2, and to be a moment, we need a force and an eccentricity and our eccentricity is L. What we really wanna solve for is R2 here, where we get R2 equals WL times one half L divided by L. So that gives us one half WL squared divided by L, gives us one half WL kilonewtons. So we now have our reaction two. Let's sum our forces in the y direction, or upwards being positive. We have our unknown R1 going upwards. We have our analogous point load 
WL going downwards, and we have our now solved for R2, which is 1 half WL going upwards, and we want to know what it takes for this equation to be zero. We can now rearrange this, and when we solve this, we get that R1 equals 1 half WL kilonewtons. Well, really, if this is an even load, what this is saying is that half of the entire load is going to go over here, and half of the entire load is going to go over here. And the entire load is our uniformly distributed load times our length. So one half of the uniformly distributed load times the length, and one half of the unidis uniformly distributed load times the length. So now we have equations to find our reactions for an for a beam of unknown length with unknown uniformly distributed load on it. Let's try now cutting it. Cut somewhere between R1 and R2. There is something happening at every single point along there, but it seems to be consistent. There's no discrete major change happening. So let's now draw ourselves a new free body diagram of our partial section. So we have our uniformly distributed load, W, which is in kilonewtons per meter. We have our reaction, which we've already solved for now, is 1 half WL, and that's in kilonewtons. And we're cutting this at some unknown length X in meters. We need, we want to know what it takes for this thing not to move. There's loads being applied, so there must be something internally that keeps this end from swinging around. And it's how it's connected to the rest of the member, which means there is a load or the transference of forces between those two parts. And we want to know what that is. So there's my placeholder for my unknown shear and the placeholder for my unknown moment. Well, this is a bit of a pain, this, uh, this uniformly distributed load. I am going to redraw this same section as an analogous point load. So the, same, the exact same section, my reaction is still 1 half WL in kilonewtons. But now, instead of that, I'm gonna have an analogous point load. My length is X in meters. And this analogous point load is our load times whatever length we're talking about here, or W times X. We have our unknown shear and our unknown moment holding this thing in place. So now let's sum our forces in the y direction where everything upwards is positive. And we have our 1 half WL. We have our unknown Wx going downwards, and we have our unknown shear going downwards. We can rearrange this equation, and we end up with V equals WL divided by 2 minus Wx kilonewtons. That seems like a bit of a pain in the butt for an equation, but we're gonna hold on to it and maybe when we look at a few discrete points, we'll be able to develop some more interesting information. So let's now sum our, our moments about the z-axis 
And remember, I always like to pick point X when I do this exercise. So I'm gonna imagine there's the thumbtack right here and I'm going to spin my paper about that. I've got my one half WL or my reaction causing it to spin in that direction, which is a negative number or minus one half WL. And to be a moment, you need a force and uh, uh, an eccentricity or uh, a distance away. Um, so we've got minus one half L times X. We have our analogous point load causing it to spin in the positive direction or plus WX times, and this is where we need to figure out what our distances are. This is happening, this entire load was our W times X, and this is happening at one half X, or also one half X. So WX is happening one half X away. I might put these in brackets, just maybe you might find that a little bit easier to hold on to the information. We also have our unknown moment spinning it in that direction, or plus moment equals zero. We can multiply these together where we have minus one half WLX plus one half WX squared. So let's rearrange that though and bring them over to the other side. So this was negative, it's gonna become a positive. We have WLX divided by two minus WX squared divided by two. So we have just two equations now for anywhere along the unknown length of this beam. Let's check a few positions on that, the same way we did with the other one, for a little summary. We're gonna check our X in meters, and our shear in kilonewtons, and our moment in kilonewton meters. When we had, so we had X equals zero, to L, we had an equation for V that was WL squared minus WX, and our moment was WLX divided by two minus WX squared divided by two. Let's check a few discrete points. Let's do it at X equals zero, X equals one half L, and x equals l. You can definitely check more points along this, but I wanted to show you something. Um, at zero, if we put zero in for x, we have wl divided by two minus zero, or wl divided by two. If we plug zero in for x in the moment equation, well, we have a zero there and a zero there, our moment equals zero. If we plug one half L into everywhere there's an X, we'd have WL divided by two and WL divided by two, or zero. If we plug one half L into everywhere we have X here, we end up with WL squared divided by two minus WL squared divided by two. If we uh, uh, or sorry, we'd have WL squared divided by four minus WX squared divided by two, which when we sum those up ends up being WL squared divided by eight. And let's plug L in to everywhere we had X or WL divided by two minus WL or minus WL divided by two. And for our moment, if we plug L in, we'd have WL squared divided by two minus WL squared divided by two, or zero. So let's redraw, let's draw our free body diagram, our shear diagram, and our moment diagram. 
So our free body diagram was an applied load of W kilonewtons per meter. We had a length in L in meters. And we solved all of these reactions. We solved these reactions to be WL divided by 2 and WL divided by 2 in kilonewtons. And so this is our free body diagram. And this is our shear force diagram in kilonewtons. And this will be our bending moment diagram in kilonewton meters. Okay, let's take a look at what some of these values were. For our shear, when x equaled zero, we had W L divided by two. And that was true, oh, sorry. When we did it at zero or at one half L, we got zero. And when we did it at L, we got W L divided by two, negative. If we did this at these points here, if we went through and calculated this, you would find that those were the values, or one WL divided by four. Feel free to do that check. Our moment at, at X equals zero was zero, and at X equals L was zero. And at the midpoint was WL squared divided by eight. If you went through and check this, you would find that it's a parabolic equation. So it's not a circle, it's not a straight line. It is a squared value. It is, it is, um, it is uh, our x squared is in that equation up here. Uh, but our worst case is WL squared divided by eight. Shear, it didn't matter which side you were talking about and negative and positive doesn't have a lot of meaning in shear. We need it to keep track of when we switch sides, but the value itself, the, the absolute value is what matters. So it looks like for a UDL on a simply supported beam, R1 equals R2 equals WL divided by two. Our maximum shear equals WL divided by two. And our maximum moment equals WL squared divided by eight. This is the most common type of beam we ever tend to, de to design. You can do positive, negative there if you want. If this is the most common beam we design, it's probably 95% of the beams we design, rather than go back and do method of sections every single time, which we 100% can, well maybe we can take a little shortcut and say, well if I know what the load is, W, and if I know what the length is, L, I can find out what the reactions are, I can find out what the maximum shear is, and I can find out what the maximum moment is. This maximum shear is at zero and L, and this maximum moment is at L divided by two. So there's a lot we can infer now, just if we have L and W. We maybe don't have to do pages of calculations, maybe we can just do these three lines of notes. 
So I'm going to end the examples here. Um, this one's a really weird one where it was so heavy in examples, but now you're gonna go flip over to your, uh, your full lecture. If I was able to get these from my phone to my computer, my phone just absolutely craps out every time I try to do it, I could splice them together, but I've been having absolutely no luck with that.